Welcome to Grace Digital Presentation. In this video, we will cover the nature of baptism. Let us now consider the nature of the baptism experience as illustrated in the Bible and not as people sometimes talk about it in their testimonies. When the scriptures speak about the Holy Spirit's baptism, in no case is there a direct reference to any kind of emotion. Of course, it is very natural for people to articulate how an experience has affected them. If our emotions were greatly stirred, that is what we will highlight. However, this is not what the Word of God emphasizes. You can see for yourself that there is no distinct reference to emotion in the different places where the baptism in the Holy Spirit is written and illustrated. But this does not go against emotions, as emotion is part of our complete human makeup. If an individual's emotions are not converted, that person is not fully converted. Our emotions should be converted. They should form part of our total Christian experience. But this is not an absolute with reference to the baptism in the Holy. What does the Bible tell us about receiving the Holy Spirit? The Bible uses two figures or word pictures. First of all, we read of baptism. In the New Testament, this word is used in connection with the Holy Spirit seven times, which is quite a large number of times. The other word that is used is drinking. If we put these two together, we will form a comprehensive picture from the Bible of the experience of the baptism in the Holy Spirit. A baptism. Baptism is an immersion, and this immersion comes from above. Its definition has never changed. It has always meant to immerse. Here we are talking about baptism, not of water, but the Holy Spirit, a coming down of God's Spirit from above over the believer, enveloping him in heaven's atmosphere. This is one aspect of the experience. We read in Acts, Acts 2, 1 and 2 says, on the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place. Suddenly, there was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm, and it filled the house where they were sitting. The whole atmosphere around these believers was filled. They were immersed from above in the supernatural power and presence of God. Let's move on to the next occurrence. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that the people of Samaria had accepted God's message, they sent Peter and John there. As soon as they arrived, they prayed for these new believers to receive the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit had not yet come upon any of them, for they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John laid their hands upon these believers, and they received the Holy Spirit. Acts 8, 14-17 Notice the phrase, the Holy Spirit had not yet come upon any of them, the Samaritans. Receiving of the Holy Spirit coincided with the Spirit's falling upon them from above. Then, in the 10th chapter of Acts, Peter was preaching the gospel to Cornelius, a God-fearing Roman centurion, and a number of his relatives and close friends. We read, even as Peter was saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell upon all who were listening to the message. The Jewish believers who came with Peter were amazed that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles, too. For they heard them speaking in other tongues and praising God. Acts 10, 44-46 Notice that the Holy Spirit fell upon and was poured out on them. These phrases describe an immersion coming down from above. The scripture is very consistent in the descriptive terms it uses. Peter spoke about this immersion to his colleagues in Jerusalem, who had called him to account for his unusual behavior in going and preaching to the Gentiles. He told them, in essence, Well, what could I do? While I was speaking, the Holy Spirit fell on them as he did on us at the beginning. Who was I to resist God? He gave them the same gift that he poured out on us. So all these terms are tied together. The baptism, the falling, the receiving, and the gift. They are merely different ways of describing the same experience. A similar occurrence is found in Acts 19, when Paul explained the gospel to the disciples at Ephesus. As soon as they heard this, 
they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then when Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in other tongues and prophesied. Acts 19, 5 and 6. Notice the phrase, came on them. The baptism is a supernatural coming down of the Holy Spirit over the believer, immersing him not in water, but the glory of God's presence. At this point, I imagine some people might be saying, the book of Acts is merely historical, so we can't derive doctrines about the baptism in the Spirit from it. Yet the Apostle Paul taught, all scripture is God-breathed, given by divine inspiration, and is profitable for instruction, for conviction of sin, for correction of error and restoration to obedience, for training in righteousness, learning to live in conformity to God's will, both publicly and privately, behaving honorably with personal integrity and moral courage, 2 Timothy 3.16. All scripture is profitable for instruction. Since the book of Acts is part of scripture, it is profitable for doctrine. The Bible presents doctrines in two ways, statements or commands, and descriptions of experiences or events. When we put together the two event and statements meet, we then have a clear picture of what the Bible speaks about because we have all the information. This concept is comparable to a jigsaw puzzle that you have to put together, with the exception of one missing piece. And when you discover the piece, it fits perfectly. So it is with the baptism in the Holy Spirit, doctrine, experience, and the events described in the book of Acts all unite, and when you find agreement from every angle, you know you've got it. A drinking, taking in, the baptism is not merely something that comes down over us, but it is also something that we receive into us. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, that we have all been made to drink into one spirit. This ties in exactly with the words of Jesus in the book of John. On the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. By this, he meant the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time, the Spirit had not been given, since Jesus had not yet been glorified. John 7, 37-39 Jesus was referring to the gift of the Holy Spirit for the one who believes, and he compared the receiving of it to the act of drinking. He said, if anyone thirsts, which means if anyone has a longing in his heart, he then said, let him come to me and drink, which is saying, let him receive into him. Flowing out. At this point, a marvelous miracle occurs as the thirsty person becomes an outlet for rivers of living water. Instead of not having enough for himself, he becomes a channel of supply to many. Relating to others is one of the purposes of the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Maybe you have enough to get you to heaven, but you do not have enough for a needy world. You need the rivers that will flow out of your life. The outflow of the baptism makes perfect sense. The Bible is the most flawless book in the world and there have never been found an error or a fault in it. Matthew 12.34 says, Out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. When the heart is so full that it can no longer hold its contents, where does it overflow? Through the mouth. The baptism in the Holy Spirit is a supernatural infilling, and it is a supernatural overflow. How do you know when the vessel is full? It begins to overflow. I cannot see inside your heart or your spirit, and you cannot see inside mine. But when we see and hear the overflow, we know there has been an infilling. Today, literally thousands of people are being baptized in the Holy Spirit just as described from the Bible. The experience of the baptism is clear, logical, scriptural, and practical. If it is not practical, it is not scriptural. Again, where doctrine, biblical events, and personal experiences are in agreement, we discover the true nature of the baptism. Let us pray. 
O Heavenly Father, guide us into a deeper understanding of your word as I draw near to you. May I understand your teachings and apply them to my life. Psalm 111.10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All those who practice it have a good understanding. His praise endures forever. In Jesus' mighty name, I declare and decree that a revelation of wisdom and knowledge of the word would be dawned upon me. Amen. Make sure you like and subscribe. People also ask, who is the Holy Spirit? To watch our video on that topic, click here.